Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about g g g ghosts. <laughs> That's pretty good. My g g g ghost is pretty bad, actually, but there you go. You should have you should have done it in a Scooby Doo voice. Well, I I mean I was aiming for that, but I can't actually do voices, <laughs> so you just have to take what you can get. This okay. is our Halloween episode, indeed. So we are going to be talking about words for ghosts and ghost words. Yeah. But before we get to that, a couple of items. First of all, thank you to our newest Patreon supporter, Amy Pistone, who, by the way, is a Pistone or A P I S T O N E on Twitter. And I strongly suggest you follow her because she is a classicist who's really working towards public engagement and public scholarship and is really doing a lot to move the field forward. And thank you very much for your support, Amy. Hi, Amy. Second, as we mentioned in the last episode, we will be attending the Sound Education Conference in November, which is assuming we are putting this out right before Halloween, very, <laughs> very soon, soon. <laughs> November 1st to 3rd. Yes. Doing two panels on Friday, the second, one on Professor Sue podcast and one on... Language and Linguistics. Podcasts. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to be presenting on the Saturday. This is new information. We're basically trying to make ourselves so busy that we can't actually attend <laughs> or get any of the benefits of going to this conference. <laughs> But anyway, uh, on the Saturday, we're going to be doing a short presentation. We're not sure of the time yet, which is going to be a sort of mini version of our podcast. Yes. On colors. Well, you can give them your title because you're very proud of it. <laughs> I can't remember. What... Rainbow Connection. Oh, right. The Rainbow Connection. Yes. Now you can have that as an earworm. <laughs> the Rainbow Connection. Yes. So if you are anywhere in the vicinity or could be in the vicinity of Harvard on the November 2nd or 3rd, we'd love to see you. And please do let us know if you will be attending because we'd love to catch up. Can we list the uh, other participants in those panels? Certainly. So on my panel that I am moderating, I say my, <laughs> we're each claiming one, I suppose, but I will be moderating a panel, Professor Sue podcast with you, Mark, on it, mm -hmm. and Scott Cohen from Stonehill College, I believe, Ed O'Donnell from Holy Cross, who is a host of In the Past Lane podcast, and Andrew Bottomley from State University of New York College at Oneonta, who has put together podcasts with his students, including Oneonta Voices, and also does research on podcasting as a medium. And the Language and Linguistics panel that I'm moderating has a stellar lineup, including Kevin Stroud from the History of English podcast. I imagine a lot of our listeners listen to that podcast. And Ryan Paulson of Lexitecture. Right. And Amy. And Amy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she wasn't in the initial email, so, no. but that's right. No. So Ryan and Amy of the Lexitecture podcast. Mm -hmm. Amy's coming all the way from Scotland to attend yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's some dedication. And Mignon Fogarty from Gra Grammar Girl. Again, probably a lot of you know that one. And finally, Patrick Cox from The World in Words. So it's a nice mix of people. Mm -hmm. So we're really looking forward to that. I think what we're going to be doing is probably mostly questions, posing questions to the panel rather than having people give talks, but we will see how that goes. All right. So that's in November coming up very soon. And we are also hoping to do some recording while there so that we'll be able to share with those of you who can't make it to the conference a little bit of what went on. No promises yet as to what exactly we'll manage to do. <laughs> since we've scheduled ourselves so heavily, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. All right, so that's all the admin. So let's get on to cocktails. Okay. So today, if the topic is ghost, there are actually, for once, a lot, quite a few cocktails to choose from. That of... somehow doesn't surprise me. No. So you, Mark, are drinking a green ghost. It's funny because it doesn't look all that green. Well. It's sort of more of a yellow, if you ask me, but... Well, let's ask our listeners. <laughs> what color do you think it is, listeners? It's made with gin, green chartreuse, and lime. Mm -hmm. So it has green things in it. Why don't you go ahead and try that? All right. Hmm. That's not bad. I have not historically been a green chartreuse fan, but actually I quite like this. Yeah, I'm actually kind of envying you yours, and I may have to try one like that later. Because what I'm having is called the liquefied ghost. 
<laughs> it's it, just as appetizing as it sounds. It was described on the website <laughs> that I took it from as like a milkshake for adults. And the only thing that's adult about it is the two ounces of vodka in it. Mm. So it is with vodka, vanilla sugar syrup, simple syrup, and cream and club soda. That's what I'm skeptical about. No, it just tastes like vanilla ice cream. It tastes like a float. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, is what it, it's like yeah. as if you'd done a float, but without a ginger ale or whatever, just the soda water. Just so soda it's a little water. tingly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess and, I guess the the sweetness from the the sugar syrup mm -hmm. kind of makes up for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really does taste like somebody just melted vanilla ice cream, right? In mm, some okay. soda, club soda, basically. All right. So uh, not a sophisticated cocktail, <laughs> no, shall we no. say? <laughs> it, it's like a vanilla ice cream, a, a spiked vanilla ice cream. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm not saying I dislike it. You understand? Yeah. So, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be listening to the voiceover for the video on Ghost. Do you want to introduce that in any way, or are you good for... Well, um, yeah, it's last year's Halloween episode, and the jumping off point is the word ghost and other words referring to ghosts, but it eventually finds its way to ghost words, which you'll find out what that means in a minute. All right, well, let's listen to that then. England has a reputation as a particularly haunted place, as Owen Davis points out in his book The Haunted, A Social History of Ghosts. The English language does have quite a few words for ghost, and looking at the history of these words can tell us something about the history of belief in the ghostly and supernatural in England. The word ghost is probably the prototypical term for the concept in English, and ultimately comes from the Proto-Indo-European root geis, used to refer to the emotions of fear or amazement. So literally, a ghost is just a scary thing, and not necessarily the disembodied spirit of a dead person. That original sense is echoed in the Old English verb gastan, meaning to frighten, and in the modern English word aghast. However, the Old English noun ghost, from which we get ghost, was most commonly used to refer simply to the soul or spirit in Christian contexts, and not necessarily to a frightening thing. This is connected to the religious distinction between the soul and the body. Think of the expression, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This soul-body division might lie behind the headless ghost trope, except in cases where the deceased was actually beheaded, which was, in fact, a very uncommon form of execution in England, despite what you may have seen in medieval movies. And it's interesting to note that although the headless ghost is a common trope in literature, it's not so common in real-life reports of ghost sightings. There are, of course, a few cognates in English related to the word ghost, perhaps most amusingly the Americanism's Snallygaster, a kind of mythical monster supposedly found in Maryland that was said to prey on poultry and small children, and Snollygoster, which means a shrewd person devoid of principles, especially a politician. Both words come from German schnell, quick, plus geist, spirit, perhaps through Pennsylvania Dutch, actually a dialect of German. Of course, that word geist also forms part of poltergeist, which literally means noisy ghost. The polter part comes from German poltern, meaning to make a noise, rattle or rumble, and comes ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root which means to cry out or yell, which also gives us such words as bellow, ball, and belch. Poltergeist was first used in print by Martin Luther, the instigator of the Protestant Reformation, but it didn't make it into English until Catherine Crow used it in her 1848 collection of ghost stories, The Night Side of Nature, referring specifically to the poltergeists of the Germans. Crow herself, it seems, later had a run-in with the spiritual realm when one night in February 1854 she was found naked in Edinburgh, convinced that spirits had turned her invisible. The word poltergeist only became popular in the 20th century when used by psychic investigator and debunker Harry Price. Harry Price, a friend of fellow debunker and magician Harry Houdini, was a target for the ire of noted spiritualist and writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, inventor of Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle at one point threatened Price that if he didn't give up his attacks on spiritualism he would meet the same fate as Houdini. It's interesting that the noisy poltergeist should make its way into English spiritualist culture in the 19th and 20th centuries, since over that time reports of ghosts speaking became more and more rare, after having been not uncommon in the early modern period. Conveying information was of course one of the purported reasons for ghostly appearances. In an 1829 case heard by the Leicester magistrates, a Mrs. Bridgart brought charges against her serving girl. When questioned, the girl reported that she had seen a ghost sent by God to admonish the wicked boys of the household who were all liars. The servant girl was let off with a warning. 
ghosts could even appear to correct legal injustices, as in the 17th century case of Sir Walter Long, whose second wife tried to have her stepson disinherited, but the ghostly hand of the first wife appeared between the parchment and the candle impeding the clerk from drawing up the legal documentation. In Latin, spirits of the dead were referred to by such words as umbrae, manes, lemures, and larvae and these words make it into English at least in a limited way, particularly when referring to or translating classical Latin texts. Umbrae was literally translated into English as shades, a word that comes into English through the Germanic root and is related to shadow. The Greco-Roman underworld was said to be filled with dim shades of the dead who could sometimes return, as seen for instance in some famous scenes in Homer's Odyssey. But more common in English is spirit, which comes from Latin spiritus, literally meaning breath, think respiration. It comes ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that means to blow, which comes down through the Germanic branch as Old Norse fisa, meaning to fart, which then makes it into English as fizzle. So if the belching poltergeist wasn't enough for you, here's a farting spirit. Some of these Latin words make it into the 1597 book Demonology by King James I. Yes, King James wrote a book about supernatural threats, such as Lemures and Umbrae Mortuorum, literally shades of the dead. King James also defined the term wraiths as spirits that appear in the shadow of a person newly dead or to die to his friends. So a wraith, by his definition anyway, was the spirit of a person either on the point of death or having just died, not returning later. We don't really know where the word wraith comes from, though it first appears in Scottish English, possibly from the Old North vorther, meaning guardian, or perhaps connected to wrath, implying a vengeful spirit. J. R. R. Tolkien suggested a connection to writhe, perhaps appropriate to his use of the word in The Lord of the Rings. Another more recent mystery ghost word is spook. First appearing in English in 1801, it seems to come from some unknown Germanic source. Spooky. Moving on to places ghosts are found, it turns out that haunted house is etymologically redundant. Haunt comes into English most directly from French hante, meaning to frequent or haunt, ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root that means be home. This root gives us English home, but it also gives us, through Old French, the diminutive form hamlet, a little village, and in the context of ghost that inevitably reminds us of the famous ghost in Shakespeare's Hamlet, though that name is not etymologically related but more on that in a minute. There is, of course, a long history of ghosts on stage, reaching right back to the ancient world. The Greek playwright Aeschylus was first to use ghosts as vengeful characters who intervened in the plot, and Euripides used a ghost in a scene-setting prologue to introduce the play. Such techniques in Greek playwrights were picked up by the Roman Seneca, who was a major influence on Elizabethan drama in the time of Shakespeare. The ghost of Hamlet's father is perhaps the most famous literary ghost of all time, and he is an example of the ghost of the murdered come back to reveal his killer. Though this may seem more the stuff of a sensational literary trope, early modern authorities did indeed take such claims seriously. Murder investigations have been launched on the evidence of ghost sightings as in the 1660 Westmoreland case of the ghost of Robert Parkin appearing before one Robert Hope crying out, I am murdered, I am murdered, I am murdered and in 1728 the body of a boy of Bowminster Dorset was exhumed on the evidence of sightings of the boy's ghost. It is in this fairy world that Hamlet can be driven to revenge against his uncle on the say-so of his father's ghost. And indeed it's striking that such beliefs held on in the Protestant era. Before Martin Luther and his fellow reformers, the Roman Church's doctrine of purgatory could easily allow for the idea that the ghosts of those not yet admitted to heaven on account of their sins, or the spirits of the righteous come back to admonish the sinful, could well return to the mortal realm. But it seems somewhat surprising in Protestant England in which Reformation theologians rejected Catholic notions of purgatory as mere superstition. And this brings us back to Hamlet, who is himself not sure of the reality of the ghost, but it leads him nonetheless to start thinking about the nature of life and death. Speaking of Hamlet, the legendary story is recounted in a number of different versions, most importantly in the Danish writer Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum, or Deeds of the Danes, in which the name Hamlet appears as Amleth, or actually Amlethus in the Latin. So, as I mentioned before, this name is not related to the word Hamlet, meaning little village. The traditional interpretation of the name, based on the elements of the Old North Amlothi, is that it is composed of ama, to vex or annoy, and other, mad or frantic, and this obviously reflects the character of Hamlet feigning madness in order to avenge the death of his father who was killed by his uncle who married his widowed mother. 
That second element, Othar, meaning mad or frantic, is the name of one of the gods in Norse mythology, the husband of Freya, and the word also seems to be the source of the name of the god Odin. And not only does it have the meaning of madness or frenzy, but also poetry and inspiration, which as that spirit root suggests can even imply possession. What's more, Odin is a god of the dead, what's technically called a psychopomp, from the Greek word for spirit, psuche, leading the souls of the dead to the afterlife. Specifically, Odin plays host to dead warriors in Valhalla, and Odin is associated with the Wild Hunt, the ghostly procession of hunters in wild pursuit through the sky thought to presage great calamity. Now getting back to Shakespeare, his other famous ghost is that of Banquo in Macbeth. In that story, the ghost returns not to reveal his killer, Macbeth, but instead to haunt him. Like Hamlet, the play Macbeth casts a long shadow over the history of English literature. After Shakespeare, perhaps Britain's most important playwright is George Bernard Shaw, who himself wrote A Macbeth Skit, a short comic sketch about the relationship between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Though Shaw did not contribute to the canon of stage ghosts, he did work for a while as a ghost writer, for a music criticism column in the satirical publication The Hornet. Of course, Shaw's most famous play is Pygmalion, adapted into a musical as My Fair Lady in which a pretentious linguist named Henry Higgins tries to turn an ordinary cockney flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, into a true lady by giving her elocution lessons. Though Shaw denied it was a truly biographical sketch of anyone, he did admit that the character of Henry Higgins was based largely on real-life linguists Alexander Melville Bell and Henry Sweet. Bell was an expert in phonetics, elocution, and proper speech, much like Henry Higgins, and invented visible speech, a system of phonetic symbols for writing down speech sounds, which was useful not only for teaching proper elocution, but also for teaching the deaf to speak. Bell was the father of Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, which I suppose now gives us the opportunity to ghost friends and lovers we wish to dispense with by not answering it. As for Henry Sweet, he was indeed also a gifted linguist, publishing widely on phonetics and spoken language, and writing the first description of the educated London dialect known as received pronunciation. Nevertheless, he neglected his studies in German at Oxford University, instead pursuing his own research, which often focused on medieval Germanic languages like Old English and Old Norse. He produced a number of very important works in those fields, including editions of medieval texts, textbooks, and a dictionary of Old English. He was also a very ornery man who made enemies due to his abrupt and confrontational nature. You can see the outlines of Henry Higgins' character there. In particular, he was very bothered by the fact that he never received a university professorship that he thought he deserved, and he was also troubled by the numerous state-funded, tenured German scholars who were publishing widely on the subject of medieval English, which he thought ought properly to be the national heritage of England and off-limits to the Germans. He was joined in this view by fellow medieval scholar and contemporary Walter William Skeet. Skeet also published widely on Old and Middle English literature, as well as writing an etymological dictionary still consulted today. One of the important editions of Old English Skeet published was of the Lives of the Saints by the Anglo-Saxon homilist named Alfrich, which includes the sermon called De Auguriis, or On Auguries. Basically, it's a sermon against using magical practices for predicting the future. But because the manuscripts he based his text on were not completely comprehensive, he left out of his edition a biblical story from the first book of Samuel that was present in only two manuscripts, known as the Witch of Endor. No, not that Endor. To summarize, King Saul of the Israelites, worried about his impending battle against the Philistines, consults a necromancer known as the Witch of Endor. She calls up the ghost of the prophet Samuel, who foretells Saul's defeat and death in battle. This story was a particularly contentious one in terms of its religious interpretation, whether or not it's possible and allowable to magically conjure up the spirits of the dead, and has had a variety of treatments. In art from the Middle Ages onward, Samuel is sometimes depicted as wearing his burial shroud, and this image, not necessarily of Samuel in particular, but of ghosts in general appearing in their death shroud, is what lies behind our stereotypical image of the ghost looking like a person in a white bedsheet. Indeed, it was generally the custom in Europe, especially for the poorer classes, to use the sheet from the deathbed as a burial shroud. Coffins were mainly only used by the wealthy and aristocratic until the 19th century. In 1666, a law was passed in England requiring that, instead of the traditional linen, shrouds had to be made of wool in order to boost the local textile industry. And because of the many sightings involving white-sheeted ghosts, and presumably the many hoaxers who donned a white sheet to get the appropriately ghostly effect, it became potentially hazardous to appear at night in white clothing. 
In one instance, in 1851 in Manchester, a thief named James Devine wrapped the white calico cloth that he had just stolen around himself and was confronted as a ghost, then apprehended and prosecuted. In a rather more unfortunate instance in Hammersmith in 1804, a bricklayer named Thomas Millward was taken to be a ghost on several occasions on account of his white working clothes, and was eventually shot to death by an excise officer named Francis Smith, who did indeed take him for a ghost. But in any case, all this accounts for the standard Halloween costume of putting a sheet over your head to dress as a ghost. Just make sure no one thinks you're the real thing. But getting back to our philological friend Walter Skeet, he is also notable and particularly relevant to our purposes for coining the term ghost word. A ghost word is a fake word that appears in dictionaries, usually as the result of an editorial error. One famous example of a ghost word was doored, which appeared in Webster's New International Dictionary from 1934 to 1947. It was originally intended as a chemistry abbreviation for density, D or D, but was accidentally taken as the word doored. And speaking of fake language, in addition to ghost words, we also have zombie rules. These so-called rules were never really descriptions of how grammar actually worked, but were nonetheless insisted on by prescriptivist grammarians, often from the 18th century, trying to make English syntax conform more to Latin syntax. Well-known examples are don't split the infinitive, as in the famous Star Trek line to boldly go, and don't end a sentence in a preposition, as lampooned in the quote attributed to Churchill, errant nonsense up with which I will not put. They are called zombie rules because, although they are dead, they seem to keep coming back to haunt us, in spite of linguists' best efforts to kill them. Interesting that the undead reference here is to zombies, since they weren't originally undead. The word zombie comes from a West African word akin to Kimbundu znambi and Congo zombie, and meaning god or fetish, originally referring to a snake god. The word may also have been influenced by a Louisiana Creole word from Spanish sombra, shade, shadow, or ghost, from Latin sub, under, plus umbra, shade, or shadow, that we saw before. The word made it into English in the 19th century, and it was really only in Haitian folklore, sometimes associated with voodoo magic, that the zombie became the reanimated corpse that we know today, and then was further transformed by zombie films particularly George A. Romero's 1968 Night of the Living Dead, from which we get the undead mindlessly attacking humans in order to eat their flesh or brains. Getting back to ghost words, not only can we find fictitious entries in dictionaries, but in other types of reference works, such as encyclopedias and atlases. A fictitious entry in an encyclopedia is often put there not by accident, but as a copyright trap to prove other encyclopedias were plagiarizing the entries. In maps and atlases, false entries take the form of trap streets and paper towns, the latter famously providing the setup for John Green's novel of the same name, which includes the fictitious hamlet Aglo, New York. Similar map terms include phantom settlements or phantom islands, and this brings us to our last batch of words for ghosts, words whose etymologies all have to do with seeing or appearance. Phantom and the related phantasm come from Greek phantazein, which can be traced back to a Proto-Indo-European root that means to shine. Similarly, from Latin we get spectre from spectrum, ultimately from the root spec to observe, and the word apparition comes from Latin pareo to appear or obey. So phantoms, spectres, and apparitions are all ghosts that appear to us, as opposed to ghosts that remain invisible and only make sounds or knock things over. And as a final example of a ghost word involving phantom, an entry for the word phantom nation was picked up by several dictionaries as an erroneous reading of two separate words, phantom and nation, in a passage about the underworld from Alexander Pope's translation of Homer's Odyssey, the phantom nations of the dead, bringing us to the end of our own long journey from words for ghosts to ghost words. So speaking of ghost words, I mentioned quite a few in that uh, in that little piece, but there are in fact many, many more words for ghost over the course of English language history. Mm -hmm. It's almost like people are preoccupied with them or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I want, I'll talk about some of these other words, and first mm -hmm. I actually want to start off with the word death, which as I'll explain in a minute can be used to refer to spirits, mm -hmm. but obviously is nonetheless very related to the idea of ghosts. So death and to die mm -hmm. and all those various related words come from the Proto-Indo-European root deu, which means to die, 
Shocking. <laughs> so yeah, nothing surprising yet. Slightly more surprising is that root also produced the word dwindle from, oh. from Old English dwindle. Okay. Dwin. I mean. It makes sense once yeah, you hear it. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't have guessed it. No. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not like it means to grow. No. <laughs> it's not like the word for shining that means black. Yes. <laughs> it's not that level of kind of surprising. This root also produces the Latin word funus, which oh, yeah. okay. sounds surprising, you know, phonologically speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But semantically it makes perfect sense because mm -hmm. uh, funus means death, funeral, or burial. And in mm -hmm. fact, we get the English word funeral from yeah. it. Yeah. Funus funeris. So mm -hmm. the uh, root is really funer. Funer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we get English funeral, funereal, and uh, a word that I only just uh, found out about, funest. English funest. It sort of ah. looks like funest. But yeah, I was going to say, I'm funest. pretty sure it doesn't mean that. <laughs> I don't I, know it. I presume it's pronounced funest. Um, it's only got one end. Yeah. It's only got one end. So, yeah. I do not know it. No. Well, it means portending death. So, makes sense. Okay. From Middle English funesta, which meant unlucky. Okay. Now, this Proto-Indo-European root deu also has a, a is is related to a kind of expanded form deu with a, just a little extra schwa sound on the end, basically. Yes. Or at least it's believed to be related to this, which means to close, finish, come full circle. Oh. And again, okay. you can kind of yeah. see the connection there. And from that root, we get the the English adverb down, as in to go down. Oh. Okay. Which comes from, interestingly, this, this one particularly surprised me, from an Old English phrase, off duna, off from a hill. Really? Yeah. The, the that, word down? Down comes from a phrase, down from a hill. So that down is therefore the, the same thing as the other word, the noun down. Oh, As like above downs. the downs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which means hill. Okay, that is surprising that to me is because very down surprising. seems such a basic, basic word. word. Yeah. 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 As a preposition and a mm -hmm. adverb. Adverb. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you yeah, have the, surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> so the downs as in, you know, sort of rolling hills that are often right. used for grazing. No, and, and, and that like. part makes sense because yeah. I knew that word. Yeah. And so this word seems to come into English from a pre-insular Celtic borrowing into Germanic. So that is to say, it comes into <laughs> the Germanic languages from, from a Celtic, Celtic language word before on the they mainland. came to, on the mainland before right. they came to Britain. Okay, all right. So it's a very early borrowing, in other words. Right. Also, unsurprisingly, the word dune is related to this, like ah, sand, sand dune. dune. Okay. Right? So it's another kind of hill. Makes sense. Which uh, comes through French and Dutch, ultimately from that Celtic root. Mm -hmm. And from this Celtic root, we also get the Old English word. Toon, which becomes modern English, town, because a town is a sort of fortification on a hill. Right. Okay. So these are all related. Surprising. They're all related to death. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising right. people words, but there <laughs> yeah, you go. That, that is, that is a, yeah, that's a cluster I would not have predicted. <laughs> cool. Okay. Now, the word death in Old English is used in the plural to refer to the sort of deified spirits of the dead basically glossing Latin manes, which I mentioned briefly in that video. Mm -hmm. I'll talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about it in a minute. So not only the plural of death, so uh, in, in Old English, dathos, but the compound word daf godas, death gods, ah, literally. Okay. Right. So also referring to manes. Yeah. Right. So those two words. So yeah, the, the deified spirits of the dead, the gods of death or the underworld seems to be what, you know, is what, that is what that's referring to, yeah. to in that okay. case. As for manes, it literally means the good ones. So manes comes from the adjective manus, meaning good. Oh, okay. The adjective manus meaning good? Yeah. In Latin? In Latin. You don't know that word? You say that as if you do. Do you know that word? I know that word because of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't <laughs> I have to know admit, that word. I did not like know that. M-A-N-I-S? M-A-N-I-S. Sometimes M-A-N-U-S, but more commonly M-A-N-I-S. Oh, yes, well, nice. that is that must be an old Latin word that doesn't make it into classical Latin commonly. I mean, mm, I'm not going to mm -hmm. say it never makes it in, but I, unless I'm forgetting something, but I don't know that. No. Well, interestingly, that Latin word comes from the Proto-Indo-European root ma, meaning good, okay. as well, with a number of derivatives: mature, mm -hmm. matins, mm -hmm. matinee, and mater matuta, 
mm-hmm. which comes from the the adjective matutinus mm-hmm. of the early morning. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we've you mentioned that. I mentioned that else. in a, in yeah. a previous uh, video? video. Yeah, she's the the Roman goddess of the dawn that later becomes associated with uh, both Aurora and the Greek Eos. Mm-hmm. And that word, matuta, mater matuta, that phrase, leads to the word, the very obscure English word, matuto lipea, morning <laughs> sadness. I mean, it's not an obscure feeling, but yes, I do think it's an obscure word. <laughs> yes, that feeling, you know, you wake up in the morning. Uh, so all that from death. <laughs> <laughs> now, the earliest word attested that is Ever? U- no. it's really impressive. <laughs> in old English, oh, okay. that is used in old English to refer to what we now think of as a ghost. Okay. That is a uh, the this spirit is so of much a less of a back to breaking news piece than it yes. was the earliest word attested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the earliest, earliest word, word meaning ghost, ghost in right. English is not ghost. <laughs> it is in fact the word soul, right? Which right. would make obviously sense. Be yeah, a connection there. So old English soul. Soul could be used to mean the disembodied spirit of a deceased person or occasionally an animal, regarded as a separate entity and invested with some degree of personality and form, as it's defined in the dictionary. But it could also refer to soul in the other sense, the the living the Im- it's yeah. something you have in your body, yeah. in the yourself. spirit in the body, yeah, your immortal soul. Now it's uncertain where this word comes from. It's a Germ- it, from a Germanic root. So it has cognates in other Germanic languages, mm-hmm. but where it comes before that is not clear. Hmm. It's some, sometimes said to mean originally coming from or belonging to the sea, hmm. because <laughs> that was supposed to be the stopping place of the soul before birth or after death. From the sea we come and to the sea we return? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what they say in the... So if so, it would come from the Proto-Germanic root siwas, which is related to the word sea itself. Okay. And uh, another sort of version of that explanation is that it might mean something more like from the lake, because the difference between different bodies Types of water of bodies was not, water, yeah. not so strict, So, which was thought apparently to be the dwelling place of souls in ancient Northern Europe. Hmm. Okay. So some kind of sea-lake connection, possibly. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Now, another word that, a common modern English word Mm -hmm. that you may be surprised to hear was once used to refer to a ghost, Mm -hmm. is the word hue, as in the color word. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. So it could mean from Old English until into the early modern English period, not only color, but it could also mean an apparition or phantasm. Hmm. It used to mean, it used to have both of those senses, color, form, or appearance. And it's from that sense that Hugh, therefore, comes to refer to a ghost. So the appearance of something. Right. Okay. Like imago or something like that. form of something like imago. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root ke, which is a word that referred to various adjectives of color. It was originally a kind of color word, Mm -hmm. but also sort of more loosely appearance, mm-hmm. from which we get the word hoar or hoary, H-O-A-R. That gives us hoarfrost. Hoar, hoarfrost, yeah. Right. Okay. As well as, interestingly, the German word hair, as in mister, right? We refer to something oh, as H-E-R-R. H-E-R-R, right, 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 Herr right, Schmidt or whatever, right? right. right? Mr. Smith or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that usage comes from Old High German hair, meaning worthy or exalted, and therefore it becomes right, an so honorific. A, right. Okay. Now, I talked about phantasm. A number of other sort of formulations of that same root appear at various times. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, fantasy. Right. Can... With, with spelled with the PH in early texts often. Yes. And so that could refer to, you know, a, a phantom, basically mm-hmm. the same word as uh, phantom in Middle English. The word ghost, by the way, didn't have the sense of a, a spirit returning from the dead until the 14th century, really. Hmm. I mean, it was a word in Old English, but it referred more to the soul in the sort of, right. you know, the Hence spirit. the Holy Ghost. Yeah, the Holy Ghost, that sense. Yeah. And haunt can be become a, a word for ghost in the form haunter. Right. So that, for instance, appears in the 15th century to and refer Pokemon to. And Pokemon Go. Oh, is I there a Pokemon oh, Isn't there a Pokemon haunter? haunter? I think there is. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> and I mentioned shade and also shadow itself is mm-hmm. used for... Uh, referring to ghosts from the 15th century. Mm-hmm. And appearance. Just the word appearance. Just the word appearance uh, okay. in the 15th century could also be used to refer to a ghost, something that appears. 
Now, what sort of surprised me and what ties this podcast into this year's Halloween video. Which, is, depending on how much you do between now and the time when this is released, yeah, I don't know which is may or may first. not be out. <laughs> so this is either foreshadowing or just a tie-in, but <laughs> is the word hag. Right. Okay. So hag, we think more, you know, referring to like a witch or something, an old crone, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the roots idea of hag is not an old woman specifically. It's a witch, you know, someone who practices right. witchcraft. Yeah, yeah. But it could also in the in the 16th century be used to refer to various types of kind of spooky things, you know, shades uh, of the parted ghosts, hobgoblins, terrors of the night, various right. types okay. of scary things. So that word hag, which means witch in Old English, is actually a shortening of a compound word in Old English, hagtes or hagtessa. Hmm. And so it got just, means... the end just got clipped off. So the first element of that hag is related to the word hex. Hmm. Of, okay. You know, curse. A, yeah. A curse. And is related to the word hedge. Huh. So it comes from the root kag or kag. <laughs> right. Because the, 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 the k becomes yeah. the, the H. The H. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the same sound yeah. change that you it see in canis and hound. Yeah. So that, that root kag means to catch or seize. Okay. But it can also mean a wickerwork fence. As a something that holds that holds, people in. Yeah. Holds, holds animals, hold, in. animals in or something like that. Now, the second element of that uh, Old English word, hag tessa, the tess part, comes from the root deu, which we've talked about before. Shining? No, not shining. The death one? No, not in this God? episode. No, not God. <laughs> <laughs> it means to, to blow or to fly about or rise like smoke or something like that. Oh, this is your fart bird. Not your fart bird. Yeah, this is, it was um, in the, <laughs> it was in the Christmas episode. Turtle dove. Yes. Dove. 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 Yeah. So smoky, moving like smoke, something like that. And so, yeah, we get dove, we get the word deer, which originally referred to the breathing. So it, it, it was animate. a general word for animal. And so it meant animate. And typhus, interestingly. Which makes you inanimate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But that element probably had the sense when it became that Tess element, mm -hmm. probably had uh, the meaning of something like a fairy or a demon or a spirit. Something okay. like that. Something so along those this lines. is a so a hedge spirit or something. Uh, yeah, and the the compound might have had the general sense of something like a hedge rider or she who straddles the hedge, like being between on the on the border between things. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. So the hedge was the boundary between civilized world, right? You know, like the, the village, pale. the the pale. Yeah. So the, settle, beyond the settlement pale. beyond mm -hmm. the pale and the world, the wild world outside. Mm -hmm. And so hmm. that's what a hag was. That is interesting. Hmm. But we've gone quite a ways from ghosts. We have gone quite a ways from ghosts. So let's bring it back mm -hmm. with the word wizard. Have you heard that word before? Nope. It's an obsolete <laughs> word. Uh, I don't think so. I, I vaguely feel like I might have seen it at some point, but not as a mm. something in use. It's from the 16th century. It's related to the word visor. So it comes from a root that means to see, wade, the Proto-Indo-European wade, from which we also get the word video mm -hmm. and therefore visor, the Latin word video to see. But it also comes into English in the word wise. So a wise person is someone who sees. Right. If you think of it that, that way. That makes sense, yeah. And from that, wizard, another word that I'll be talking about in, in, this... in this year's video. So tune in for that. Or you've already seen it. Yes. We really don't know. <laughs> Though actually, I suspect this podcast will come out before the video. Probably. I suspect the video is going to be to the last minute. We'll see. <laughs> now, another word that makes it in directly from Latin is umbra. I mentioned that wait, as a Latin so, word. Wait, go back Go back to wizard. Yeah, wizard. What does it mean? You never actually said- It means what? ghost. Phantom, oh, okay. You, didn't, you, you yeah. never said that. Oh, you sorry. Said the, the These word. are all words that mean ghost. Okay. So wizard yeah. means ghost. Ghost. And is a word that means something you see. Yes. Okay. I okay. guess the, in the sense of an apparition right. type okay. thing. So yeah. that was not. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so umbra, yeah, mm -hmm. a Latin word, which comes directly into English mm -hmm. um, with the same meaning, uh, a, a shade, a spirit. Yeah. Though not used in modern English these days. Not anymore, but it has been. Yeah. yeah. And that Latin word comes from the Proto-Indo-European root anho, which means blind or dark. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. A yeah. shade. Right. And that word, that, that root leads to a number of English words like somber, 
Mm -hmm. Sad feeling. And sombrero, a hat that gives you shade. Right. Oh, right. So yes. literally, yeah. both somber and sombrero, literally sub umbra. Yes. Yes. Under the shade. Under the shade. Right. So when you wear a sombrero, you're under the shade. Mm -hmm. And it possibly also influenced, as I mentioned in the video, the word zombie. Yes. Right. As as a sort of side word. I mean, it's not the word it comes from, but no. it may have influenced the way yeah. it sound, ended up sounding. Right. So the word it, it comes from is from some Bantu language. We don't know exactly which. Mm. Uh, forms like zombie and znambi, which meant a fetish. But it may have been influenced by umbra. But it may have been influenced by umbra through the Spanish form sombra, which means shade, shadow, ghost. Right. And I might talk about the word fetish itself. In your video? In my video. So right. another little teaser for that. <laughs> Can you tell that Mark's in the middle of research? <laughs> it's all whizzing around his head. I can almost see it. <laughs> I can see the diagram you tried to make on the blackboard of all of these connections. Yeah, it was too complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of lines going a lot of different places. So another Latin word that makes it straight into English is larva. Mm -hmm. That <laughs> makes it into English. With a different sense. With a different sense. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But so larva is first attested in 1651 in the sense of a ghost. Mm -hmm. And larvae, the form larvae with an E at the end, a little earlier in 1620. Okay. The Latin word larva can mean both ghost and mask. Mm-hmm. It's uncertain exactly where that Latin word comes from, but it might be related to the lares. Right, which are spirits of the house. Yeah. And where that word comes from, well, mm -hmm. this is one of these cases of uh, Etruscan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, especially anything to do with religion, they're always very happy to go, eh, Etruscan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there is apparently a, a word, uh, an Etruscan word, lar, that seems to be the source of this. Okay. Now, of course... As you mentioned, the other sense of the word larva in English is the biological sense of mm -hmm. an early early stage of development in when insects. When you say the other sense of the word, you the mean the only sense, sense the anybody only sense knows, anyone knows now. Yeah. Yes. And that word comes from the mask right. sense of the of the Latin word. Because it masks its later form. Yeah. So the 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 young form masks the adult, the mature adult form. Mm. Uh, this was this terminology was invented by Linnaeus, the mm -hmm. taxonomer. So these kinds of ghosts in Latin are also known as lemures, mm -hmm. which is probably from a non-Indo-European word. Who knows where? Etruscan? Etruscan? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but is possibly related to the word lamia, which in, comes into English, meaning mm -hmm. ghost. But it is a Greek word, originally, that means... Well, actually, the English word, not so much ghost exactly, but more female demon. Okay. In Latin... Lamia means witch or sorceress or vampire. Seems to have this vampire. Sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. But ultimately from Greek, Lamia, which means female vampire, man-eating monster. And it's mm -hmm. the eating that's crucial there. To yeah, the it's actually man-eating or child-eating. Child and actually eating. the or some of the earlier stories have to do with eating children. Right. Her own or others. Literally, it means a swallower. Ah, okay. So it comes from uh, limos, throat or gullet, mm. and oh. is related to larynx. Gullet is one of those words that we use in English, and I don't even know what it means, really. It's just one of those <laughs> words, words that yes. turns up, yeah. <laughs> one of these. Throat. It means some throat. part of the throat, some, some yes. Some part of the swallowing. And it has to do with, sorry, larynx. Larynx. It's related to larynx. So, so getting back to that related word, uh, lemures, there is, of course, the Roman festival of the dead, Lemuria, mm -hmm. which if you've watched or listened to our previous episode on Jack-O-Lantern, mm -hmm. I, I talk about this. It has a part to play in when the date of Halloween is. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. So for the ancient Romans, Lemuria, which was this is actually in May, so things get shifted around, was supposedly, anyways, a festival to exercise the restless and malevolent ghosts of the dead and included a ritual of walking around the house in bare feet, throwing black beans over the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Lots of fun. <laughs> hey, the Romans knew how to party. Thank Everybody you. knows the Romans are all about the orgies <laughs> and having fun. But again, the word lemures or lemur, as it makes it 
in the English. form that makes it into English, is the result of our friend Linnaeus. He borrowed this Roman word for ghosts to name the primates, lemurs, because of their nocturnal habits. Except that he actually named the wrong species. A, something that isn't what we ended up calling yes. species, the yes. slow loris, right? Yes. Yes. So it gets a bit mixed up. But basically, it was also sort of because of their kind of ghostly appearance of the big wide eyes, mm -hmm, they're sort of mm -hmm. spooky looking and the, the, the cry that they make. But it's, it's fitting because the, the legend of the Malagasy people of Madagascar- Where Lemur, lemurs, lemurs are. Were, yeah. Uh, were the, the souls of their ancestors. Right. So again, kind of ghosts from the Coincidentally- the dead. Coincidentally, yeah. So I bet you anything, Linnaeus. Linnaeus not was that. not thinking that at all, but it, it kind of works mm -hmm. nicely. Now, another word for ghost in the 17th century was idolum. I guess that's probably how it's pronounced, idolum. It comes from Latin idolum. Which comes from Greek. Which comes from Greek, ultimately. It's related to the word idol, the English word idol. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it comes from idolum in Latin and idolon mm -hmm. in Greek, mm -hmm. which comes from idos. Mm -hmm. which means form, shape, likeness, mm -hmm. resemblance. So it's that idea something of a, you've seen. something you see and it's in the it, it's in the the likeness of a human being but it's, you know, mm -hmm. this And Idolon is of course the name of the online classics magazine. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And that word idos comes from the same root that we talked about just a minute ago, like wade to see. Video, yeah. Video. Idosin. Yeah. And so kind of while I'm on this particular word, uh, mm -hmm. sort of similar to this, not related etymologically, but a similar idea is the Latin word imago, which we mm -hmm. briefly mentioned before, which comes from the verb imitari, mm -hmm. which means to copy or imitate. Mm -hmm. We always get the word imitate from that and the word image from mm -hmm. imago, mm -hmm. which comes from the Proto-Indo-European root im, which means to copy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we get imitate, emulate, imagine, they all come from that. So, so this word imago makes it into English directly from Latin. Mm -hmm. So imago in English doesn't mean ghost, mm -hmm. but in a kind of interesting connection to what we've been just talking about, it, it refers to the final or adult stage of an insect. Oh, no one ever uses that. No. So that's coined in the 18th century, mm -hmm. end of the 18th century. And so the name is due to the fact that uh, such an insect, having passed through its larval stages and having, as it were, cast off the mask or disguise, shows its true image. Shows its true image. Right. Yeah. And of course, there are many, many, many other words that refer to ghosts throughout the history of, I've just picked out the sort of most interesting, but if you sort of look at the later ones, there are, are some that come from other languages like mm -hmm. churl, which comes from India. Oh, say again? Churl. Okay. It specifically means the ghost of a woman who has died in childbirth, believed to haunt lonely places malevolently and spread disease. Uh-huh going to sidestep all the discussion that that could lead to because <laughs> yes. we don't have time. Mm -hmm. The word jumbi, which is sort of parallel to zombie, mm -hmm. uh, basically, but it means ghost or evil spirit uh, and is used in the West Indies. But there's a number of words that come from Celtic, various Celtic, specifically, you know, Scottish and Irish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, words. So thivish. Okay. First used in English in the 19th century it means ghost or apparition or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. These are sort of literary words, right? Yeah. So they they make it in into English because famous writers like Yeats mm -hmm. or well, that they may be dialect words that are actually used. Yes, but they make it into English in, as into literary English words. as yeah. literary words. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that one in particular is associated with Oscar Wilde and Yeats. They both kind of use that word. Mm -hmm. Solf which I guess is how it's pronounced in English. But again, it comes from Yeats, so it's an Irish word. Okay. Bodach, another Irish word. Primary sense means peasant or churl, but it can also mean specter. Hantu, that's from further afield. Yeah, that's not Celtic. Generally. Not Celtic, no. <laughs> that comes uh, from Malay. Okay. So it's a Malay word. Okay. And wild huntsmen, I remember, yeah. I mentioned the yeah. wild hunt, so that gets used to just refer to phantoms. Duppy, again, that's a word associated with the West Indies. Mm -hmm. I recently saw that in the Anansi stories by Neil Gaiman. Right, right. 
So, I mean, there are lots of words that have more recently made it into into mm-hmm. English from various sources. So, you know, if you're writing a ghost story, mm-hmm. you've got lots of words to work with. Yeah. And each one presumably has a slightly different slightly tradition different, of how yeah. they work and where they come from and how to get rid of them and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. Well, you really covered all the words. I have no words to add particularly. But what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about some, you mentioned in passing, some ancient ghosts. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, the famous ones in the Odyssey. Right. But I was thinking more of ghosts in the sort of, I was thinking about what ancient ghosts are there in the kind of haunting us way. And the idea of people who really are coming back from the dead to pester the living in some form. These are, I guess, more kind of folk stories than epics. Well, I'm not there yet. Um, (laughs) So there's, there is specifically the epic ghost. Right. There's a ghost in epic who we start with the Iliad and we don't stop. No epic, no self-respecting epic would be without at least one. Mm. Now, these are ghosts that come back in dreams. So there's a really strong tie between Mm. ghosts and dreams. And in the ancient world, you often see ghosts in dreams, which when I think about ghost stories in the English literary and folk tradition, they aren't really dreams. You don't see them in dreams. They come back in a more... So I'll talk about some of those as well. But to cover off some of the most famous ghosts in literature in the classical world... You have Patroclus, Achilles' friend, after he's dead, he comes back. And specifically, he comes back in a dream to Achilles and says, you haven't done what I told you to do. You're treating me badly and scares Achilles, pestering the living. And then so that's in the Iliad. And so once you've had that in the Iliad, everybody has to have that. Right. In the Odyssey, it's he goes to the entrance to the underworld and he calls up shades from the underworld. And that's very ghosty but Mm -hmm. it's a different kind of ghost Mm -hmm. but then you have the aeneid you have hector's ghost comes back hector comes back from in a dream to aeneas to tell him warning him that troy is falling and he has to get out actually as he leaves the city aeneas famously escapes troy with his father on his shoulder and his little boy held by his hand and he walks out and totally forgets about his wife and she walks a few paces behind him we're told and in the confusion of leaving the city he loses her And by the time he goes back for her, she's dead. And she comes to him as a ghost. So we have Creusa's ghost who comes back and says, oh, dear, it's okay. It's totally not your fault. (laughs) The goddess of um, Mount Ida wants me to stay here anyway. So go off and make sure you find another mother for our son and go marry again. It's totally okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, this is the story he's telling to Dido. (laughs) This This is told by Aeneas to Dido as he's just been rescued from a shipwreck. So anyway, but anyways, it's ghost is the important point here. He also sees the spirit of his father later on. In the underworld. In the underworld. So, I mean, he does. I'm kind of trying to stick to ghosts who are... In the land of the living. Come back Mm -hmm. from the dead. There's a whole other world of going to the underworld. Right. I mean, he sees Dido. He sees everybody in the underworld. But in terms of ghosts that come back from the dead... His father actually comes to him in a dream at one point, too. Hmm. So we have a bunch of dead people come to him, him in dreams. And that's really the form in which it, it happens again. After Virgil, we have some of the other famous ones and kind of impressive ones. In the Thebaid by Statius, we have a number of ghosts, but in particular, we have Laius, and Oedipus's father, uh, right. who comes back to Oedipus's son and curses him in a dream. <laughs> Um, not that he needs more cursing. There's a lot of cursing yeah. going on at in that, that point, family. There's, there's, no, there's no escape. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's because the Thebaid is the story of the seven against Thebes where mm. and the, the civil war of the two twin sons of Oedipus. So we have him and, and it's it's told and he's very gruesome. He still has all of the marks. And this is one of the things about these ghosts is they have the marks of their death on them. Huh. So Hector, when he comes back in the Aeneid, is bloody and right, and has good. all of has uh, the marks of being dragged, dragged behind the chariot, the chariot, right? Yeah, As yeah. if even though the body was cleaned and buried. But it must have been totally mutilated by that. But point. but even so he's he comes back still with the blood matted on him and right. you know as if as if he is trapped in that mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. Um and Laius Laius comes back and is with the blood and the gore of the, his death. In Lucan, who wrote the uh, another epic about the civil war between Pompey and Julius Caesar, uh Julia, Julius Caesar's mm-hmm. daughter, 
comes back at one point to in a dream. So all of these are in dreams. Comes in a dream to Pompey, her husband. Mm. She died in childbirth, and uh, she comes back to him and and tells him that he's going to die soon, and they're going to be reunited in the underworld, and that the whole underworld is in total chaos because of all the people that be that are being killed in the civil war, <laughs> and then they can't process them fast enough, basically. <laughs> Administrative nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so the, but there's a lot, there are lots of epic ghosts you could go right. through. And, and so, so that's a thing, is epic, but they come in dreams. There's also tragic ghosts, and you mentioned that in passing. So a very famous one is Clytemnestra in the third play of the Aeschylus trilogy, known as the Oresteia, uh, in the play called The Eumenides. She's killed in the second play. And in the third play, towards the beginning, she turns up as a ghost, and yells at the Furies for not managing to drive her son crazy yet. Right. For, um, you know, well, what are you doing? Are you giving up? You can't give up. And she, and she again comes, you know, sort of bloody. And so there's definitely this idea that the, the ghosts are terrifying. Hmm. They're scary. They're not just prophetic. These are dead people who died violently, who come back Angry. with the marks of their violence and mm -hmm. the violence on them. Mm -hmm. And are terrifying to people in their dreams. But because they're in dreams, you this is sort of... I mean, the epics definitely treat them as truly there. Mm. They're real ghosts who come back. But when you wake up, many of these people, when they wake up, forget... Aeneas seems to always forget his dreams when he wakes up. Um, Creusa, I guess, is not a dream. But they often don't remember them, or they only sort of remember them. It's, it's, the, it's the reader who sees them right. more than the person in the dream. And then there's a, there's, Euripides has ghosts. That, so there's a number of tragic ghosts who are interesting. And then Seneca, the Roman playwright who, the Roman many things, but one thing he did was write some tragedies. Mm -hmm. And he adapted and translated uh, or adapted uh, Greek tragedies. And he really went to town on the ghosts. He really likes the ghosts. Right. And it's his ghosts that are important for Shakespeare's yes. ghosts, yeah. right? Seneca yeah. is, is hugely influential on all of the revenge tragedies and tragedy in general. Tragedy in general, yeah. Because it's the only, it's the only Latin tragedy that survives yeah. to the yeah. Middle Ages. So yeah, he the became, structure yeah. of Renaissance drama it's comes based from, directly from directly Seneca. Directly on yeah. Seneca, yeah. Yeah, and many, many other things in it. And so one of the things he has is these vengeful ghosts mm. who come back. For instance, in the Octavia, which may not actually be written by Seneca, but is attributed to Seneca, the ghost of Agrippina, mm. the mother of Nero, comes back to haunt Nero, which, in fact, we have Suetonius also tells the story that Agrippina, whom Nero had murdered, mm. so there's just a good reason <laughs> to come back. Um, so in the Octavia, she comes back to to haunt Nero, for instance. So there's those Shakespearean ghosts come quite directly from yeah. from Seneca, who is basing them on the Greek tragedians. I'd thought of these epic ghosts, and I was trying to think of other ghosts. So I posted on Twitter this afternoon. And I said, "Okay, classics, tweeps, give me ancient ghost stories." And I listed off some of the ones I could remember, and I said, "Can you think of any like?" hauntings mm. as opposed to these literary tropes of these dreams right and i got a lot of responses <laughs> a lot so i am not going to go through all of them i'm not even going to mention all of them though i've i will mention a couple of them the agrippina in the octavia for instance is one i hadn't thought of what i am going to do before this podcast comes out i will put those i will make a list of all of these passages right. and references that people have given me. Probably not individually cited. I'm sorry, it's just a little too complicated. But uh, I appreciate everybody on Twitter who's given me the... When I say not cited, I mean not cited by the Twitter people who gave me the right. passages. But I thank them all very much. But I will put together a list of all of them and I will make... Put it in a little document or something and put that a uh, link to that on the show notes. Right. So if you would like to go and look, I'm I'm not claiming it's comprehensive, but... Frankly, by the time this tweet has finished being retweeted and <laughs> responded to, I suspect I'm going to have a lot of them right. <laughs> because I have a bunch already. And I'll, I'll put that list together because it's kind of neat. And yep. it, it really does range over a lot of these literary ones. But then there's a lot of ominous ones. Mm -hmm. That is ghosts who are omens of something. So right. ghosts of you know, where it's a, a, 
a fantastic appearance of a woman who turns out to be, who says she's Africa, who tells him a man that he's going to become a general and get glory in Africa and then die in Africa, for instance. Or so, you know, omens, you could even put in that same category, the image of Rome who turns up to Julius Caesar before he crosses the Rubicon in some versions of the story. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, so that it's not really a ghost, it's a divine appearance, but there's a real in-between level. So I have a list of those. From those, there's one other sort of literary one that I think I'm going to, I'd like to just take a moment to to share because it's kind of fun. Well, okay, there's one I'll just mention in passing. There's a pseudo Virgilian, that is, it's attributed to Virgil, but most people don't think it is actually by him, poem called the Kulex that's sort of a mock epic. And in it, yeah. a shepherd kills a gnat <laughs> that bites him. Right. And the gnat comes back as a ghost. <laughs> To haunt the shepherd in a dream. Nice. Which is, yeah, pretty awesome. So we have a ghost gnat. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously it's playing on that hmm. epic trope. Plautus has ghost stories. There's a bunch of other ones. So I'll have a list of that later. Gotta love comic ghosts. Yep. There's a bunch of ghosts of all sort of different kinds. Men Menander has a play called The Phasma. But there is one who's presumably... In some ways, it's another kind of joke or parody of the epic ghost. In Propertius, who is a love poet, writes love elegies in book, his girlfriend in books one through three. So he writes four books of poetry. Hmm. And in the books one through three, his poems that are about a girl are mostly about a girl called Cynthia, whom he loves and who rejects him and who he pines after. And they have all the typical kind of love affair stuff. Well, in book four, it turns out she has died. And she comes back in poem seven as a ghost. I'm not going to read the, the poems reasonably long. Basically, she comes back and yells at him for not showing enough grief that she's dead and finding another girl. And isn't he an asshole, basically, is hmm. <laughs> what the poem is. But it starts with a little meditation on the idea of ghosts at all. This is in the translation from the, the Oxford World's Classics by Guy Lee. Mm -hmm. Propertius Book 4, Poem 7. A ghost is something. Death does not close all. A pale shade escapes, defeating the pyre. For I have seen Cynthia leaning over my bedhead, though lately buried by the busy road. While sleep for me was hung up on love's funeral, and I mourned my bed's cold kingdom. She had the same hair as when born to burial, the same eyes, but the dress she wore was charred, and the fire had eaten into that barrel on her finger, and lethe water had chafed her lips. Anger and voice were those of the breathing woman as her brittle hands snapped their thumbs. And then she goes on to yell at him, Traitor, from whom no woman need expect good faith. Can you have fallen asleep so soon? Etc. You know, how dare you forget me so easily? And uh, yells at him, You didn't follow my funeral pyre long enough. You, weren't, you didn't care about me enough. Uh, you've got other girls now. But then she sets him a sort of a set of duties, hmm. what, he, what she wants from him. Take care of my nurse and my other slaves. Make sure you don't aren't mean to them and then maybe release them. Take care of my grave. Burn those poems you made about me. <laughs> Cease your boasting about me. Take care of my grave and my gravestone. Write me an epitaph. Here in Tibertine ground lies golden Cynthia bringing glory to your banks, Father Anio. And pay attention to dreams. And when... When you die, others may own you now. Soon I alone shall hold you. You'll be with me, and bone on mingled bone I'll grind. Ah. And then she vanishes. Having thus dealt with me in bitter accusation, the shade from my embrace faded away. <laughs> and even that's a, a, an epic trope, because all of those ghosts that turn up to Aeneas in mm -hmm. particular, though others as well, they always try to, the living always try to embrace the dead. Right. If they're their mother or their father or... And they always, they can't, hmm. they can't touch them and they vanish after as they try to embrace them. I have a slightly tangential question. Yes. But when parodying epic mm -hmm. in, in Latin poetry, do you write it in the sort of metrical form of an epic or do you use something else? Either. So that Kulex poem, the pseudo Virgilian mm -hmm. is written in an epic meter, mm -hmm. in the epic meter. The Propertius poem is an elegy. Okay. So it's written in elegiac couplets. Now, elegiac couplets have one line of dactylic hexameter, which is the epic meter, right. and then one line of iambic pentameter. Right. So, I mean, Ovid plays with that, where his very first poem, 
in elegies, he starts with, I was going to write an epic, but then Cupid stole a foot away. Mm-hmm. So the first line sounds like epic, and the second line is one foot too short. Right. It's only a pentameter, not a hexameter. So you can do it either way. You can actually have something that in form is like an epic, and then you make it non-epic, burlesquing it. Yeah. Or you can use epic. The parody can be really importing epic tropes into a non-epic meter. Right. By using epic ideas in something that explicitly by meter shows that it's not epic, it's already parodic. Yeah. It's all about that incongruity. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that's Propertius. But what I was asking people to find me, and people did, was more on the sort of haunted house kind of idea of a ghost, right? right? So not a dream or somebody who comes, some vision that comes or some haunting that occurs. And I did get various other interesting ones, but the one I want to read a part of is from Pliny the Younger. And this one's, a lot of people brought this one up. And this is a letter from him to a friend. So Pliny the Younger, not Pliny the Elder, who wrote all of the Hmm. encyclopedia and all the natural history stuff. This is the younger one. And he has a bunch of letters. And this is the one he wrote. It's a book seven, letter 27. So 727. Hmm. And... He starts off writing to his friend Sura. The leisure we are both of us enjoying gives us gives you an opportunity of imparting and me an opportunity of receiving information. So I should very much like to know whether in your opinion there are such things as ghosts. Hmm. The word he uses there is phantasmata. Okay. So he uses the Greek word, Greek really. Word. Whether you think they have a shape of their own and a touch of the supernatural in them, or whether you consider they are vain, empty shadows and mere creatures of our fears and imaginations. And you can imagine, this is, for an educated Roman, this is a real question. I mean, as Propertius started off with, ghosts are a thing. Mm-hmm. It's not a given any more than they are. There's, after all, there's um, Epicureanism, which says there's no immortal soul. Mm-hmm. There's nothing after death. So it's not a given that they're, you know people survive after death. For my own part, I feel led to believe that they have a real existence. And this mainly from what I hear befell Curtius Rufus. And then then he goes on to tell a story, which is also told in Tacitus, about this important person, Curtius Rufus. In the days when he was poor and obscure, he had attached himself to the person of the governor of Africa. And one evening he sees the figure of a woman, taller and more beautiful than mortal, who presents herself to Rufus, who's terrified. And she says she's Africa and can foretell the future. And she tells him what's going to happen in his life. And then it all comes to pass. Now, to me, that's not really a ghost. The figure of Africa, Mm. it's not a dead person, right? But after all, it is a phantasmata. Right. If that means a vision. Yeah. Right? So he groups it in. But then he goes on to tell two more stories. And the second one I'm going to tell in, in detail. Now I want you to consider whether the following story, which I shall tell you just as I heard it, is not even more terrifying and no less wonderful than the other. There stood at Athens a spacious and roomy house, but it had an evil reputation of being fatal to those who lived in it. In the silence of the night, the clank of iron and, if you listened with closer attention, the rattle of chains were heard, the sound coming first from a distance and afterwards quite close at hand. Then appeared the ghostly form, eidolon is the word he uses there, Mm -hmm. again Greek, of an old man, emaciated, filthy, decrepit, with a flowing beard and hair on end, with fetters round his legs and chains on his hands, which he kept shaking. The terrified inmates passed sleepless nights of fearful terror, and following upon their sleeplessness came disease, and then death as their fears increased. For every now and again, though the ghost had vanished, memory conjured up the vision before their eyes, and their fright remained longer than the apparition which had caused it. Then the house was deserted and condemned to stand empty, and was wholly abandoned to the spectre, while the authorities forbade that it should be sold or let to anyone wishing to take it, not knowing under what curse it lay. The philosopher Athenodorus came to Athens, read the notice board, and on hearing the price, hesitated because the low rent made him suspicious. Then he was told the whole story, and so far from being deterred, he became the more eager to rent it. When evening began to fall, he ordered his people to make him up a bed in front of the house, and asked for his tablets, a pen, and a lamp. Dismissing all his servants to the inner rooms, he applied mind, eyes, and hand to the task of writing, lest by having nothing to think about he might begin to conjure up the apparition of which he had been told and other idle fears. At first the night was just as still there as elsewhere. Then the iron was rattled and the chains clanked. Athenodorus did not raise his eyes, nor cease to write, but fortified his resolution and closed his ears. 
The noise became louder and drew nearer, and was heard now on the threshold and then within the room itself. He turned his head and saw and recognized the ghost which had been described to him. It stood and beckoned with its finger as if calling him, but Athenodorus merely motioned with his hand as if to bid it wait a little, and once more bent over his tablets and plied his pen. As he wrote, the spectre rattled its chains over his head, and looking round he saw that it was beckoning as before, so without further delay he took up the lamp and followed. The spectre walked with slow steps, as though burdened by the chains. Then it turned off into the courtyard of the house, and suddenly vanished, leaving its companion alone, who thereupon plucked some grass and foliage to mark this place. On the following day he went to the magistrates and advised them to give orders that the place should be dug up. Bones were found, with chains wound round them. Time and the action of the soil had made the flesh moulder and left the bones bare and eaten away by the chains, but the remains were collected and given a public burial. Ever afterwards, the house was free of the ghost, which had thus been laid with due ceremony. Proper haunted house. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, it's like the poltergeist. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the chains it's and the chains and everything. Everything. Yeah. Like, it seemed, I was really surprised because mm. several people, at least three or four people mentioned this passage. It's quite famous, mm. but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I just didn't, I hadn't seen it before. But as you can see, several people were like, oh, yeah, I always do that at Halloween with my classes. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally see why. It's great. And there's actually a third one. I'm not going to read it all. It involves people coming in and cutting the hair of his slaves in the night. Mm. Pliny's own slaves. Mm. So he's like, and I can vouch for this one myself. And then the hair is left on the floor when they wake up. It doesn't seem a very impressive haunting, <laughs> frankly. But so he has this, these three stories. But that middle one, really, mm -hmm. to me, is just like as classic mm -hmm. a ghost story as you could ever have. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I beg of you to bring your erudition to bear on these stories. The matter is one which is worth long and careful consideration. I will let you follow your usual habit of arguing on both sides of the case, but be sure you take up one side more strongly than the other, so I may not go away in suspense and uncertainty. <laughs> To sort of believe it or not? <laughs> well, he wants to know, do, yeah. you, believe do you believe it? it? Do you believe it? When the reason I asked your advice was just this, that you should put an end to my doubts. Mm -hmm. Farewell. Interestingly, speaking of Pliny, you know, Pliny the Elder yeah. had much to say about magic. Yes. Yes, he does. Yes. He has a lot to say about magic. So he will be Featuring... prominently featured in this year's video. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as I said, there's a bunch of other ones. And just to read some of the things people said, uh, Philostratus's Heroicus has a disturbing story about Achilles appearing centuries after the Trojan War to kill the last descendant of Priam. <laughs> <laughs> There's something wow. called the Terexippus, which was a ghost that scared horses at hippodromes and caused them to crash the chariots. Ooh, that's interesting. Various ghosts for various hippodromes. Mm -hmm. So I hope that was an appropriately <laughs> spooky story mm -hmm. to end off our ghost episode for Halloween. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> so there you go. We have stories about ghosts, words that refer to ghosts, and ghost words. <laughs> and the question of whether ghosts really exist at all. Indeed. Being asked already in the ancient world, and I guess still an open question now, though I have my own views on the matter. <laughs> but since it's Halloween, we'll leave it as an open question. Yes. Well, it's appropriate because, you know, ghosts hide in the shadows, so you can never really know for sure. <laughs> so the next episodes will probably, I think we're going to have a few interview episodes coming up. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to record some things at the conference, as we said, and we've got a bunch of other people that we want to talk to. So this may become a mostly interview podcast for the next little while. <laughs> so thanks for listening and happy Halloween. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.